Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is the first webinar of the Holiday Greetings Roomscape, and I'm happy that you are here with me. Today, we're going to be fabricating festive windows. We'll be going over the drapery, the shades, and the motorized solutions. I am Donna Cash, and I am here and happy to be here. I have my own workroom just north of Atlanta in Flowery Branch, Georgia, and my focus is on encouragement, inspiration, and training for professionals in the home decor industry. When I'm in my teaching mode, my goal is to help you build your confidence, help you build your skills so that you can then build your business. Today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, however, I do have my questions pane open. So if you have a comment or a question that I can answer during today's webinar, I will certainly do that. And anything that I'm not able to get to today, I will follow up with you in a private email after the webinar. As I mentioned, this is the first in the three webinar series uh, in just after Thanksgiving on November 28th and 30th, we'll be going over the holiday bedding ensemble. I'll be showing you how to make a duvet cover, a bed skirt, a throw, pillar shams, and a really cool bolster. And then in December, I'll be showing you the upholstery projects, the headboard pieces and a bench. You can use the QR code on this slide to download your how-to guides if you want to do that right now. Uh, however, you will be getting an email with the QR code so that you can download them yourself at a later date. We also have some Roly Connect sessions tying in with this roomscape. Last week, we went over the holiday extras to elevate your guest stay. I showed you a few things that you can make to make your guests more comfortable. And then on December 8th, I'll show you how to make a star-shaped Christmas tree skirt. So today we're going to be going over how to create drapery panels with a box pleated leading edge embellishment and contrasting buttons. I'll show you my way of uh, attaching those buttons so that they don't um, drop down. And I'll also show you how to make this Roman shade with floating ribs. And what I mean by floating ribs is the ribs are placed on the inside in between your face fabric and your lining, and they're floating. They're not stitched in, they're not taped in, and they're not glued in. So more on that in an upcoming slide. And then I'll show you how to assemble a motorized Roman shade headrail system. My motto is to always start with a plan. I like to uh, put a photo of my client's uh, room into my computer system. I use Minutes Matter Studio. And with that, I put that photo in that system. I can draw the drapery on uh, anything else that's going in the room just so that they can kind of have an idea of what I'm seeing in my head and being able to help them visualize. So it always starts with a plan and I will do this to scale. So as I mentioned, this panel, it's just really just a basic panel, but what makes it unique is the embellishment, which is um, done with a box pleat. And the way that I stitched it onto the panel uh, I don't have the, the panel fabric, the box pleating, and then a separate strip to sew together. So I'll show you how I do that in an upcoming slide. The box pleats are made using the Perfect Pleater Tape. It's number DYC86, and I chose to use uh, make it a two-inch pleat width. And then the depth of the pleats is one and a half inches. So the first thing that I did is I had four drapery panels. Uh, so I cut enough fabric strips for each of those 
uh, panels and I cut them long enough so that they will be uh, three enough for three times fullness. And I see that we have a question. Just let me back up a second and get to that. What pro program do I use for my rendering? Uh, yeah, okay, so Kate, thank you for asking that question. I use the studio uh, from Minutes Matter. So it's Minutes Matter Studio. And that is the system, it's a computer system. Um, it's software that I have on my computer. I've been using it for many, many um, years, uh, but it, you can look it up studio from Minutes Matter. Great question, thank you for asking. So for the box pleats, I'm going to just st step back and I cut the strips long enough for three times fullness for the box pleats, plus a little bit extra. And then I uh, cut the strips four inches wide. I, as I mentioned, I wanted them to finish at an inch and a half. So an inch and a half, I, I needed, I folded it over, so I needed two times that plus one inch. So the strips are four inches wide. I cut them, um, I stitched them together. I did uh, make a bias. These are cut on the straight, but I made a bias seam because I like the way um, that, that folds better. I seam the strips together. I press the seams open. And then I match the long edges and uh, right sides together, excuse me, wrong sides together, uh, press the seams, uh, one long strip. So now I have uh, the long edges matched and um, then I took it over to my serger and I searched that one long uh, raw edge on my serger. Okay, so then to sew the pleats, for the two inch pleat width on the DYC86, you will notice that there are green marks and there are red marks. For the two inch strips, and, and this is in the instructions that comes with the tape, for the two inch pleat width, I'm going to be paying attention to the green markings and just ignoring the red markings. So I put the stick, it's got a little bit of stickiness, it's not super sticky, but I stuck it to the uh, long strip of fabric and I pushed it down about a half to three quarters of an inch away from my surged edge because as I'm sewing this, I don't want to sew over the tape. And so what you do is you take, to start with, you're going to pinch up and crease at the first line one and you'll fold that to meet line two. And then I stitched just a little bit. I didn't stitch all the way to the front of that fold. And then I pinched it up at, uh, at increased it at line three, and I folded that back to meet the same number two. And then I stitched a little bit. And then you just simply continue stitching until you have all of your pinch pleats made or box pleats made, and then I pressed the pleats. Now on the next slide, I'm going to show you a video. <clears throat> this is a QR code so that you can watch it uh, in the future, but I'm going to play the video right here. I'm making two inch box pleats using the pleater tape. For the two inch pleats, I'm using tape that has the red and the green markings on them. And for the two inch pleats, I'm paying attention to the green markings, not the red markings. To create the box pleats, the number one will fold forward to number two, I'll stitch, and then the, the number three will fold back to the number two. I pinch it at one, fold it to the number two, and then give a stitch. Go to the number three, fold that back to number two.
and I'll continue repeating that, holding the one to number two and then the three to number two over and over and over again until I've got the amount of trim that I need. So there are the pleated, uh, the pleats all ready to go. Oops, hold on just, okay. Uh, so the pleats are done. Now it's time to start fabricating the drapery panel. So I cut the face fabric and marked the bottom hem. So I cut my face fabric long enough for my double four inch bottom hem. And this panel happened to have a, um, I used four inch buckram, so I allowed eight inches in, uh, for my, uh, the double fold at, at the top. And then I like a nice rounded bottom hem. So what I do to uh, ensure that I don't have a flat crease at the bottom, but a nice rounded hem at the bottom, is I add beaded weight chain uh, in that bottom fold. So what I did is, uh, I placed the beaded weight chain in that bottom fold, and I'm going to play a video so that you can see that, and here's a QR code for that video as well. When we're making panels out of a lightweight fabric, such as a silk, we like to add substance to the bottom hem. Rather than cutting a piece of lining and enclosing it, I have a method that is quicker and more efficient. I'm using the 5 30 seconds of an inch fabric covered beaded weight chain. I simply drop it into the bottom hem. Hold it into place until I'm ready to put the bottom hem in with double wonder clips. Now, the reason I like this better, it, yes, it's quicker and more efficient, but it creates a beautiful rounded fold at the bottom hem, rather something really crisp. And it also adds enough weight at the bottom of the panel to create a beautiful channel of fabric from the top of the pleat all the way down to the bottom. Now, this is also available in lead free weights for those times where you may be working somewhere near a beach or a damp environment. Quick and efficient. Okay, so then once that's done, then I you can just close the hem in your method of choice. And you can see how beautiful that rounded hem is. When we're making panels out of a lightweight. Oh, hold on a second. There we go. All right. So now once you've got your bottom hem in, you're ready to table the, the drapery for the finished length. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got a four inch buckram. I allowed eight inches to wrap the buckram twice. So just press the top of the panel, add the buckram, and then hold the header closed with the jumbo wonder clips. I like these better than using uh, the pins. Uh, it's so much faster just to use the jumbo wonder clips. Then We've got uh, the, the panel is tabled to the finished length. We've got the buckram in the top hem. We're ready to uh, insert the ruffle into the lead edge side hem. So in order to do this, in my workroom, I have a standard of a two inch side hem, a double two inch side hem. So I would typically, on my leading edge and, and both of my side hems, typically what I would do is I would fold up four inches. But for this method, on the leading edge, I'm going to enclose the pleated trim, I'm going to enclose it in my side hem. So what I do is I fold and press a five inch hem allowance. I've got the panel on the table right side down, wrong side up and I'm folding in on the leading edge a five inch hem allowance. Uh, and then I'm going to place the box pleated trim on the panel up at the starting at the top. I will remove any excess pleats above that, fold in the raw edges so I have a nice clean edge at the top of the box pleating. And then I'm going to uh, 
place that on the panel in such a way that I have unfolded that five inch hem allowance and I've placed the trim along the crease line on that five inch hem allowance. It's right on the crease line. And then I'm going to stitch that down. I'm going to stitch the, the pleats down on the face side of the fabric with the hem allowance um, unfolded. So it's laying flat and then stitch from the top down to the bottom. At the bottom of that pleat, you want to make sure that you've got a clean edge again. And then we're going to enclose the pleated hem allowance inside that five inch hem allowance. So you're simply going to fold that hem allowance now back over the pleated trim. You're going to stitch from the top to the bottom, take it back over to the table, and you're going to press it. You're going to press out, uh, press the hem allowance, and then you're going to fold that back up underneath the panel and press the, the, um, the face side of that and you're just what I did is I just kind of like um, pulled on the pleat so that I got a nice crisp pressed line between the pleated trim and the panel. Now you're going to fold in that lead edge hem allowance and you can see on that first photograph on the left now that I've got that all stitched in, you can see that that five inch uh, leading hem allowance, now it's down to my four inches. So what I'm going to do is um, I've got the, the panel on the table face down. Now I'm going to add the lining. The lining's already been prepared. I've got my bottom hem in and I cut the lining in such a way that it's going to tuck up underneath the buckram up at the top of the panel. So uh, just table your panel, add the lining. The lining hem is matching up to the top of the, um, the hem allowance between the lining and the panel are matching. And uh, smooth out the lining, cut away any excess lining that you may have up at the top of the panel, tuck that up underneath the buckram, put your side hem allowance on the return side, fold that in, and then close your side hems in your method of choice. Now it's time to figure pleats and spaces. Here's what I do. I always get out a piece of paper and um, I will measure, now th these panels were a width and a half. Uh, if it's two widths, then I will have, uh, I'll dr draw the diagram. If it's three in, three widths, I dr draw the diagram for each width of fabric in that panel. Up at the top, I'm gonna get my pen so I can show you. Um, pen, all right. So up at the top, this is my half a width here. Here's my full width. But up at the top for the full width, I knew that I would have from the first pleat to the leading edge, I knew that I would have three inch, three and a half inches. So I just sketched that out. And then over on the return side, I do the same thing. So then what I do is I take a measurement from uh, I have a pin in, in um, the fabric, okay? So then three and a half inches from each edge or whatever my um, leading edge or hem, uh, side hem allowance is. So I put a pin at three and a half inches and then I measure from that point all the way over to the seam and then I do the same and I write the number. I do the same thing on each additional width, and I, and I write that number in, okay? Now I know when this is all pleated up, I know that I want 30 inches pleat to pleat, okay? So then what I do is I take, um, well, I, I add 46 plus 20, it's 20 and a quarter, but I just dropped that, um, so I've got 30, 66 inches from here to here, okay? And then I 
subtract 60 inches, which is what I need for my spaces, excuse me, 66, and I subtract 30 inches, what I, which is what I need for my spaces. So then I know that I have 36 inches for my pleats. And I also know that for this one and a half pleats, I know that I'm going to have seven pleats. So I so seven pleats, that gives me six spaces. So I, I divide 30 inches by six. So my spaces are each five inches. I have 36 inches for my pleats. So 36 divided by seven, I have 5.1 inches for my uh, pleat sizes, okay? So that's how I figure my pleats and spaces. Now I need to erase these. There we go, and let me get, there we go. All right, so now we're ready to move on. All right, so now we're ready to pleat the panel. We've got the pleats and spaces figured. I have got my panel spread out on my table and I pin down into my pinnable table for each uh, uh, pleat and each space. And I simply pin straight down in and then I use those pins to mark my pleats and spaces. And then I go ahead and now I'm ready to fan fold my panel. I tie that up, just use some um, fabric remnants, tie the panel up, and then I've got the panel, it's all neat and tidy, carry it over to my sewing machine and stitch the back edge of the pleats. Now I'm ready to make my button embellishments. This was a velvet fabric, it was kind of thick, but not so thick that I wasn't able to make my buttons. If you're new to making buttons with the button machine, I'm just going to do a quick video for you. You've got a QR code here on the slide, but I will play this video so that you can see. Button back, button fabric, button front, Look at that beautiful button. Button back, button fabric, button front. There we go. All right. So now it's time to add the button embellishment to the pleats. So at the machine, all I did was I stitched the back edge of the pleat. And then when I'm sewing a button on like this, I like to use a two finger pleat. So I simply press the two finger pleat in by hand. And uh, my method is I will sew these on. I'll use a very good strong thread and I stitch them on. And as I'm stitching them on, the button shank is placed in between that two finger pleat. So that sort of buries the button shank down in between the pleats, ensuring that the button is stitched tight up against the, the fabric itself, the front of the pleat itself, and it doesn't hang down. So here I'll show a, uh, a play a video for you. I want to show you how I attach the buttons to these two finger pleat panels. Um, and I used a two finger pleat so that when I attach the button, the shank of the button is hidden in between the two finger pleat. That also makes it good and secure and it's really tight so it's not limp and hanging off the front of the panel. So I have a, a needle threaded and I've got a, a knot and uh, a long tail. I've marked 
the placement on the front of the pleat. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the pleat and the buckram, go all the way to the knot, I'm going to come back through. that feed the button on go through the shank go through the uh, fabric on the other side of the two finger pleat pull that tight and now I'm going to go back through the fabric in the shank and come out on the other side of the two finger pleat so now I've got uh, going to go through one more time Pull the needle, pull it tight, and then I'm going to just do a square knot right over left and then left over right. And then take my clippers and clip close to the thread and then give it a good tug. And so this button is snug up to the fabric and it will tend to fall forward because it's nice and tight. I want to show. Okay, that was it for the panels. Now we're ready to make the Roman shade. So you first need to uh, determine your fabric size and your cut size um, and I like to play around with the placement especially when I've got something with uh, uh, a, a repeat and you know sometimes just changing the placement of your cut just even by an inch or so may make a difference so I spend a lot of time at the beginning before I ever cut the fabric and I lay out rulers, fabric tubes, anything that I can to really give me a better sense of what it looks like. And I always take a photograph because I can see in the photograph so much more clear than if I'm just looking because I can see the whole room when I'm just looking at it. So I always have my, my camera with me when I am at this stage of fabricating anything. So uh, for my Roman shades, my standard side hems are a double two inch. So uh, at, and my bottom, again, is a double two inch bottom hem. So I'm taking my, for the cut size of the fabric, I'm taking the finished width of the shade plus eight inches. That's my two inch, uh, two, two double side, two inch side hems. And the cut length of my Roman shades for this method that I'm showing you today is the finished length of the shade plus 20 inches. That gives me enough for my bottom hem, a, a pocket for my uh, Roman shade bar, uh, hem uh, weight bar, and a permanent fold. That's just my process here in this workroom. I always have a skirt at the bottom, a, a um, a pocket for my weight bar and one permanent fold. So the cut length is the finish length, as I mentioned, plus 20. And the lining is going to be cut the, the finished width minus a quarter of an inch. That gives me an eighth of an inch on either side so that when the lining is tucked underneath my side hems, it doesn't bump into that side hem and it lays very flat. And then the cut length of my lining for this method is the finished length of the shade plus 16 inches. And that is because I do not fold my hem in my hem of the lining into the hem of the face fabric. The other thing is I mentioned I have a skirt on the bottom of my Roman shades. That skirt is made out of, or, or it is stiffened with skirtex. I cut that piece of skirtex 10 inches long by the shade width minus a half an inch. 
And then what I do is I crease the skirt text matching the two long edges. So now I have a piece of skirt text that is doubled over and it's five inches by the, the shade width minus a half an inch. So then after I have folded in my side hems of the face fabric, the bottom hem of the face fabric, and place the lining on the inside, I place the piece of skirt text for my bottom skirt in between the face fabric and the lining, and it goes all the way down into the, the, the crease for the bottom hem of the Roman shade. So you can see that on the two bottom photos of this slide. And then I just tuck the, um, the skirt text gets tucked into the bottom hem, the lining gets tucked into the bottom hem, and I just smooth everything out, the lining out. So now we're going to prepare the back of the Roman shade. Smooth out the lining and close the bottom hem and one side hem in your method of choice. I find it easier just to do everything at the table, so everything is closed by hand. So uh, for this demonstration, the left hand on the left side of the, on the screen, uh, uh, the left hem side hem is closed the bottom hem is closed and the side hem on the right side of this screen that is left open until i've added my ribs so that's going to come into play in another slide uh, then what you need to do is mark the shade for your horizontal and vertical tap points <clears throat> then cut the shroud tube for the vertical rows of cord and you're gonna tack the shroud tube into place. You will notice on this, the bottom picture, and I'm gonna go into more detail in the next slide, but you'll notice that the shroud tube does not come all the way down to the bottom hem. That is because the, the bottom three tack points get stitched together. That gives me uh, the my skirt, my pocket for my uh, weight bar, in that first fold. So let me show you what that looks like on the next slide. All right, here I've got yellow circles on those first three tack points. Those all get stitched together. And then the, 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 as I'm stitching those three tack points together, I stitch a ring up at the top of that. So what that creates is, I'll show you over on the right-hand side of the screen. So uh, this tack point right here, that's at five and a half inches from the bottom, okay? This is three and a half inches right here. And then this is eight inches. Whoops, kind of got off the slide there. So that eight inches is going to be repeated vertically up, up the shade for my tack points. Now, if you happen to have a, a repeat where your vertical tack points are less than eight, they, they can't be more than eight to be within industry standards for um, safe shades. But if they're less than eight, then you can adjust that, that third tack point. But what I like about this method is it gives us a, a reveal of the skirt. And it really looks nice um, at the bottom. And that skirt text makes the skirt uh, ha hang very, very nice. And I do this three and a half inches that is where my weight guard bar will be inserted. So these three tack points get stitched together and then this ring gets stitched right here as you're stitching those three tack points together. Oh, now let me erase those so they don't show up on the next slide. All right. So now we're going to see the bottom, um, de the details that I, I'm using at the bottom of the shade. 
before I put um, attach the shroud tube to the um, shade, the cord is pulled out about an inch to an inch and a half. And that shroud tube, the, the empty shroud tube gets tucked in behind those tack points. I use a little dab of fringe adhesive to keep that inserted in there and keep that into place. Otherwise, if you don't want to use um, uh, uh, an adhesive, you can always hand tack that to the inside. And then that cord gets pulled through the ring. I attach an orb to the ring. And then just to keep that orb secure until I'm ready to dress out the shade, I put a pin through the cord that goes through the orb. Okay, so I do that to every um, every one every piece of shroud tube, and uh, now you've got the the back of your shade is ready to go. Um, so now we're ready to talk about these floating ribs and the weight bar. The floating ribs are literally just that; they need to be cut about a half an inch narrower than the shade width. Um, you want to make sure when you cut those that you don't have any um, rough edges. Uh, if you do, just go ahead and file that off. And then you're going to unfold that side hem, that last side hem that's not been closed yet, and you're going to sh slide the ro Roman shade ribs. For this shade, I did use the round Roman shade ribs. I have also used the, the flat Roman shade ribs and they both work equally well. So you slide the Roman shade ribs in between your face fabric and your lining and you, you slide them just above each of the tack points, above the tack points. And then once you've got them all in, then you're going to fold that remain that side hem. You're going to fold it and you're going to um, close it in your method of choice. Again, I like to use um, hand tacking. Um, I would not recommend going to the machine with this because it would be very awkward uh, with with all of those Roman shade ribs in there. So either hand tack or use an adhesive of your choice that uh, remaining side hem and then the weight bar you just slide that into the pocket uh, and then once you've got the weight bar in there and i usually uh, cut my weight bar about a half an inch more narrow than the shade and then slide that in and then i hand tap the pocket closed on each side um, you don't have to close the top of the pocket some people want to know if i i stitch that closed at the machine i do not it's simply tacked closed um, as I'm doing those three tack points, okay? So that's basically the back of the shade. Uh, now I'm going to show you a video of the floating Roman shade ribs as this shade is working and how they're not stitched in, they are not glued in, there's no tape involved. They literally sit on top of the tack points and then as the shade rises up, because it's floating, it's going to float down to the bottom of the front folds. Now you can see, let me show you one thing here. Show, share, okay, there is, there is a rib right here, okay, on this at the top. This one will just stay into place because I'm not going to have um, the shade rise up any higher um to where this one would float all right so it is just helping to add some stability to that top um, but it this one is not floating all of the others will float now i'll play the video this roman shade has got round roman shade ribs and they're Place just above the tack points. As the shade raises, the, the ribs go to the front of the folds. So you can see those here. 
Now, as the shade goes down, the shades, the ribs are dropping to the tack points. Let me see if I can show this to you on the back. Oops. Well, let me stop it and let me, so you can see the ribs are just above the tap points. But as the shade rises, the shade, the ribs just drop into the front of the folds, which I showed you on the front. And then now this one is dropping to this tap point, this one dropping to this tap point and so on all the way down. So there's always nice structure in the folds, whether the shade is up or down. And I haven't had to use any tape or glue or anything on the inside of the Roman shade, which I like. Okay, so now we're going to assemble the motorized shade tube. Uh, this is honestly the easiest Roman shade head rail system that I've ever used because there are fewer parts and it's quick and easy to assemble. So let me show you how easy that is. Let's assemble our shade tube. I've got the tube. I have a five volt wire free tubular motor. I have the crown and drive set and I have the end pin. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this piece and I'm going to look the groove on the other side, slide it onto the motor, and line that groove up with the protrusion on the motor head. Next, I'll take this piece and I will slide it onto the other end, and then take the clip and place the clip on. Okay, next. I'm simply going to take the motor, slide it into the tube. I'm going to look for the flanges on the inside of the tube. Line those up as I slide the motor into the tube. And then line the flanges up as I slide the motor in. Lastly, I'll take the end pin, look for the flanges on the inside, line those up with the grooves on the end pin, and slide that into place. Now that's all there is to it. Prior to putting the system together, I did fully charge the battery in the motor using the five volt USB charger. Just plugged it into the port on the motor head, plugged the other end into the wall, and left it in place for six hours. Okay, <clears throat> with the shade tube assembled, now it's time to attach the shade to the dust board and add the shade tube. Simply Mark it, your finished length of the shade and staple it to the board. Attach the shade tube to the board and to the brackets, and then add the end caps to the end uh, to the brackets. And then you're ready to complete the back of the Roman shade. So you want to determine the placement for the cord clips. The cord clips need to be offset from the rows of cord so that you don't have an over wrap as the shade is, is uh, moving in the up direction. Typically for a shade, uh, you're going to have up to a three inch offset. If you've got a very short shade, maybe 30 or 40 inches, um, you maybe only, only have to do two or two and a half inch offset. Uh, but for this shade, the length of this shade, I do, did offset it three inches. You want to be sure that you knot the cord to the, 
to the cord clips and place the cord clips on the shade tube. And I want to show you on with my pen. So for this row, the, the, the knot is going to be on the, um, the side of the, the clip that points towards the row of cord. Um, and, and so you can see that you got your knot on this side and for this one, you've got the knot on this side. So you can see that each, the clip has got two holes. You don't want the cord to be coming over uh, the, uh, the clip. Uh, so you're going to always have it on the same side as the cord. Let me erase that. And then once you've got uh, your, your cord clips on the, uh, the tube, then you're gonna hang the shade and you're gonna test it for the length. Uh, adjust, adjust the length as you need. And then uh, remove the pins at the orbs and, and not those not the, the uh, cord underneath the orb. And then I like to run the cord back through the orb again, and then knot it again underneath the orb. And then that way you know that those orbs aren't going to move and uh, that your shade will be um, hanging level for you. Okay, so then it's time to add your embellishment if you've got one to the shade. And, and as I mentioned, the skirt of the shade in my method hangs down a little bit. It's got a little bit of a, of a reveal. And so if you do wanna add um, an embellishment such as this or a banding or some fringe or something, then you can attach it to that reveal of the skirt. I use the fringe adhesive to apply the pleated embellishment to the shade. Um, I know that with the fringe and uh, uh, the fringe adhesive is going to give a nice permanent bond. Um, I did tuck the ends of the, um, the pleated embellishment to the inside, so I had a nice finished edge. And then I hand tacked the side hems uh, to secure that. I did happen to add a, a uh, contrasting button to the center of the shade. And I simply used uh, several strands of a very strong thread. And I simply went through uh, the back, add, went through the, to the front of the shade, went through the shank of the button, and went back to the back. And I simply did a square knot uh, to tie that on. And then on uh, uh, the, the back of the square knot, I just did a little dab of fringe adhesive to secure that knot and then clipped the threads. So once you've got your beautiful Roman shade made and you've got it all motorized, now you need to pair the shade motor to a remote control. Um, I'm going to just walk you through the steps um, of programming um, the, different, the different steps, but we have a long video, a longer video, it's about seven or eight minutes, I believe, um, and you can use this QR code so that you can use that um, as your guide to help you program your Roman shade. It's really very quick. If you're using a multi-channel remote, the first thing that you need to do is you need to select the channel on the remote that you want to use for that particular device. The device is the motor in your shade or drapery. And by the way, if you're if you're also using an RTEC motor for your draperies, the, the programming steps are exactly the same. So the first thing that you have to do is you pair the shade motor to a remote control, select the channel that you want, and then the next thing that you would need to do is once you've paired the shade motor to your remote, is you're going to check the travel direction of your motor. So uh, you would press either the up or the down arrow uh, to check the direction that your motor is, is moving. And if you need to, you would just change that. It's very easy to do that. And then once you've got your, your shade and your remote paired, 
you need to set the upper and lower limits. You do need to do that because before you set the limits, if you send your, your shade up, before setting your limits, the, the, the motor does not know to stop. So you set your limits and then you set a favorite position. And then it's always a good idea to lock the remote. And what, that, what I mean by that is uh, by locking the remote, you disable the limit setting function. So once you leave that beautiful shade in your client's home, uh, by locking the remote and disabling the limit setting function, they won't be able to accidentally uh, uh, change the, the, uh, any of the programming. So it's always a good idea to do that. Now I will do all of this in my workroom before it even goes to the client's home. Uh, just it's a good practice and it's uh, the shade is then ready to go once it's at the client's home. So I want to thank you again. These are the fabrics that we use for this Roman shade and drapery panel. We use the RM Coco TFO gold leaf. Uh, join us for the upcoming webinars because all of these beautiful fabrics were used in the roomscape. And the greenhouse seven, A7941 in color peacock, that was uh, the, the, the fabric that I used as the contrast buttons in this roomscape. Uh, I wanna thank you again for joining us today. Uh, if you wanna reach out to Roly, you can find them at rolycompany.com. We've got the phone number here for you and you can reach them at info at rolycompany.com. Don't forget we have the Roly Connect sessions to join us at three o'clock Eastern time on Friday afternoons. You can get social with Roly on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. And again, I want to thank you for joining us today. Don't forget, we've got uh, the week after Thanksgiving, we've got the next Roomscape, and then in December, we will finish off with the third. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Stay well. Bye-bye, everyone.